All right. I'd like to get going with our second speaker, uh, Diane Stadler. Her session is called Dietary Choices That Change Lives, Boosting Your Food IQ. Diane Stadler, PhD, RD, LD, is an associate professor and the director of OHSU's graduate programs in human nutrition. She's a member of OHSU's Bob and Charlie Moore Institute for Nutrition and Wellness executive team and is a registered dietitian who specializes in maternal and child nutrition. Her research centers on understanding the complex physiology of body weight regulation, and she has been involved in a variety of studies, including the healthy study to redu reduce risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes in middle school students. We'll, we'll go a little e five e extra minutes since we're getting you started five minutes late. Okay, thank you very much, Deb. And I really appreciate everybody being here today. And for those of you that are joining us online, um, welcome. And I look forward to your questions um, at the end of this session. I'm hoping that what my presentation today will do is build on the information that Dr. Bagby presented earlier and then lead into the conversation that you're going to have with Dr. Joanna Hansen, who's going to talk about nutri um, nutrigenomics, nutrigenetics, and uh, the link that all of uh, these three presentations have. Um, so, my session is really helping to provide you with some of the fundamentals for thinking about what does good nutrition look like when we're talking about uh, a nutritional environment for ourselves or for our families or for clients that we work with, what are some of the premises, those founding principles um, that we tend to fall back on in terms of appropriate, adequate, and healthy dietary practices? So, let me see how are we're just roll. Okay. Um, so I want to start just with a conflicts of interest and disclosure statement, essentially saying that I don't have any conflicts of interest, um, that I do have funding from the National Inst Institutes of Health, and I've had funding um, through this agency probably for the past um, 18 years. And the current study that I'm involved with is called the MS Weight Study. And it's a study that is developing a curriculum and testing a curriculum to teach medical students how to counsel patients on weight-related issues, dietary factors, and really trying to enhance the nutrition education that takes place in medical schools, which many of us might realize has been pretty insufficient um, coming up to this time. And so that's a really exciting study and a group of individuals that I hope will have a strong impact on enhancing the nutritional quality of people's um, lives through their practices. I don't have any current industry alignments. And I want to acknowledge that I created this presentation um, using a new platform and a new format um, in PowerPoint. And I've incorporated a lot of pictures. And all of those pictures were open source approved pictures that came off of Go uh, Google Images with permission. So if you like this template, I love your feedback, because I thought it was really, really fun to put together. Um, so you saw this word map, this word cloud that we have. And I really based this presentation on the comments and the requests that people had as you were registering for the program. There were an incredible diversity of requests for information. And I know that these conversations are hitting on many of, uh, of the interests that you had. And so just a brief outline, what I'm going to be talking about over the next 40 minutes, healthy dietary patterns. So really focusing on the whole complex nutrition, food environment that we bring into our lives, the components of uh, those dietary patterns. I want to talk a little bit of, about weight, um, weight management. Um, how to come up with appropriate ideas about weight and uh, recommendations for individuals that might be interested in losing weight. 
Um, and then why it's so hard to keep weight off once people have uh, lost weight. And then uh, follow up with some questions either about the topics that we're addressing in this particular presentation or other topics of interest that you might have. So when we think about dietary patterns, um, there are all different types of, of dietary patterns that we're exposed to and we hear in the media. Um, we hear people talking about the typical American diet. I have a, a colleague that works out at the Primate Center, and he's, he's recently graduated from the University of Oregon, and he's working there, and he's taking care of some of the monkey um, uh, colonies that Dr. Bagby referred to. And he asked me this question, what is TAD? All these monkeys on their cages, it says TAD. And they're being fed a diet that is supposed to represent a typical American diet, this Western diet um, category that tends to be higher in fat, but more specifically higher in saturated fat, but also higher in simple sugars and not as nutrient dense as the types of dietary patterns that we tend to be recommending at this point in time. So dietary patterns encompasses all of those foods, all of those nutrients. It's not specific to any particular um, type of, of macronutrient or specific vitamins. And it doesn't focus on specific amounts. So it's more the quality, the overall quality of the nutritional environment that we create rather than the amounts of, of foods or nutrients that we're consuming. And when we think about healthy dietary patterns, um, they tend to have a lot of characteristics that are common throughout um, the different classifications. There's great dietary diversity. So the number, the types of foods that are included in somebody's food profile is very diverse. It includes fruits, vegetables, but just not those big categories, but a variety of vegetables. Um, that people consume and have access to and choose to purchase and prepare. Um, it focuses, it, they tend to focus on whole foods rather than processed foods. And whole foods, not just uh, inferring that it is a, a, a type of food that is prepared and is primarily comprised of a single um, type of food, but even the way it might be processed. So going from a whole fruit apples or oranges to consuming fruit juice. Fruit juice would be considered a processed food. So we're talking about dietary patterns that really focus on that unprocessed or whole foods as much as possible. Doesn't always happen, but, but the least amount of processing that can take place. These diets tend to really focus on vegetables. You know, you hear in the media a lot, well, we need to eat more fruits and vegetables. What we're really saying is people need to eat more vegetables. Yes, they need to eat more fruits, but the tendency and the preference to eat fruits is much higher than in, veg in the vegetable component. So a higher fruit and vegetable um, inclusion in the diet, somewhere between seven and 11 servings a day. A serving being a, um, you know, a, a single medium portion sized fruit or vegetable whole grains and complex carbohydrates, unrefined as much as possible, um, healthy fats, including monounsaturated and, po and polyunsaturated fats, and I'll go into more uh, definition and description of these, um, lean meats, lean dairy products, if somebody is consuming milk and dairy products, and healthy fish, and not just the food itself, but the way it's prepared. So when I think about healthy fish, I'm thinking about fish that's steamed or grilled or broiled as opposed to deep fat fried, um, where you have so much more exposure to um, additional breading or additional fat that might be included and a fat that might not be as healthy as the fat that would be contained within that fish itself. And then plant-based proteins. We know that animal products tend to have relatively high amounts of proteins, but plant-based proteins are also incredible sources of highly nutritious vitamins, minerals, and a protein base um, that we need to become more reliant on. And then finally, water content of food. 
We also know that as foods contain more water, they tend to have less calories and they have, tend to be more nutrient dense. So foods that have more water or foods that are prepared in water, like soups or stews, um, tend to keep in all of that, that nutrition into the food that's being consumed. And then finally, they have to be easy to follow. You know, the more we encourage people to eat a healthy diet, we have to make sure that our recommendations can actually be applied, that it isn't something that becomes cumbersome, but that it can be something that can be easily incorporated into somebody's lifestyle. So I'm gonna start by telling you about three primary um, healthy eating patterns. One is called the DASH eating pattern, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but to me, this is the ultimate diet pattern in terms of food-based nutrition. Um, it is a diet pattern that has been widely studied and it's associated with just consuming it and not a, intentionally trying to um, lose weight. People that follow this pattern tend to lose weight or they tend not to gain weight if they are following this type of eating pattern. It's strongly associated with lowering blood pressure. In individuals with elevated blood pressure, and even those individuals that have high normal blood pressure um, values, an improved lipid profile or, or cholesterol profile, lower cardiovascular disease risk, and lower reduction in bone, mineral, um, bone mineralization with age. So it really promotes healthy well-being. Just recently, it was ranked the best diet overall in 2018 by US News and World Report, you know, and we all uh, look for how are these different diets classified and then how are they compared based on their nutritional quality. And the DASH diet was one of those that always rises to the top. It is a complete dietary pattern, which means you don't have to take dietary supplements to, to achieve the nutritional requirements that are recommended um, throughout um, throughout various government agencies, the RDAs, if you're following this type of dietary pattern. In particular, you are going to be consuming a diet that's high in calcium, it's high in phosphorus, it's high in magnesium and potassium. These are all nutrients that people in the United States tend to eat in insufficient quantities because the quality of their dietary um, pattern isn't as high. It's also very low in saturated fat, it's low in cholesterol, it's low in sodium, those components that you also see in terms of recommendations that we're being encouraged to restrict in our diets. This diet tends to be referred to as a very high complex carbohydrate diet, lower fat, about 28% of calories coming from healthy fats, and a moderate um, protein diet, about 18% of calories coming from protein. So 18% is a little bit higher than most recommendations, 28% fat is lower, and a 58% carbohydrate-based diet, complex carbohydrate-based diet, tends to be higher with, than what the typical American diet is. Another Traditionally recommended eating pattern is the Mediterranean um, diet eating, eating pattern. And this diet pattern is very similar to that of the DASH diet. The foods are a little different and the, the breakdown of the composition of foods is a little bit different. But it's also significantly associated with increased risk of mortality from cardiovascular disease as well as overall mortality. So it's, it's critical that we think about these diets not just for today, but also the long-term impact that they have on our health and well-being. It's associated with lower risks of cancers, a variety of different cancers, including breast cancer. Um, and also a reduction in um, either the early onset or the severity of uh, cognitive diseases in older adults like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. And the con key components of a Mediterranean diet is that it really is focused on plant-based nutrition, plant-based foods, highly dependent upon or foundational um, upon with vegetables, fruits, adding whole grains, legumes, and nuts into the diet, using herbs and spices as opposed to salt um, as a, a food enhancer, 
focusing on specific types of fat, so monounsaturated um, fatty acids as opposed to saturated fats, monounsaturated fats including olive oil and that type of, of a fat family. Um, with the Mediterranean diet, the type and amount of fat, it's more based on the quality of the fat as opposed to the quantity of the fat. So you'll see one of the big differences between a Mediterranean eating pattern and a DASH type of eating pattern is the amount of fat that is typically consumed by somebody following this pattern. Much higher in the Mediterranean diet, up to about 40% of total calories coming from fat. But again, it's the quality, the higher mono and polyunsaturated fats as opposed to um, saturated fats. When people are consuming a traditional Mediterranean diet, they tend to be including more fish in their diet, probably two times a week. They're consuming less red meats um, a few times a month as opposed to on a, on a weekly basis. May drink wine and specifically red wine um, if that's a choice of the individuals. And really creating meal times around family and friends. Having that cultural component uh, to this type of eating pattern also has a significant impact on um, the health and well being. And then finally, I want to just remind you of the MyPlate program. The MyPlate program is what is recommended by the US Department of Agriculture. And it, too, is a, a, a foundational eating plan that is built on filling your plate with fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lean meats, and a variety of foods. And so you can see in this picture, when people talk about the my plate eating pattern, what they're encouraging people to do is whenever they sit down for a meal, make sure that half of that plate is full of fruits and vegetables. It's supposed to be easy to conceptualize. Half of your plate should be whole grains. When you eat grain products, half of those grains should be whole grains. And then the types of proteins, plant-based proteins, animal-based proteins, should really be proteins that are low in fat. If you're building your, your diet on plant-based proteins, those are going to be relatively low in fat. So thinking about the quality of the types of foods that you're consuming and thinking about these characteristics, all of these patterns are built on some of those same foundational principles. So I wanted to provide some ideas for ways to build these concepts into somebody's typical dietary approach. And I have three um, initiatives that are being promoted um, quite widely now. One is the concept of Meatless Mondays. Meatless Mondays is an initiative that has been going on in the United States for about 15 years. Um, there are websites that encourage people to think about modifying your diet, if you, if you do consume animal products, um, to modify your, your meal plan on Monday so that you're really encouraging a plant-based meal on that particular um, day of the week. It's, you know, their, their emphasis is to start the week off right. Um, a, a high nutrient dense, healthy meal on a Monday night to get your week off to the right, um, to the right step. Another concept that is very popular right now is the concept of community soup nights. And this is something that can be done on an individual basis, a family basis, or opening it up uh, to members of your immediate community. There's a huge movement in Portland uh, to have these types of community-based activities going on on a regular basis. And again, if you, if you Google community soup nights in Portland, you'll, you'll find some incredible recipes for different types of soups, which tend to be very nutrient-dense and relatively low in calories, um, and that can feed um, an ample group of people. So it's, it's a wonderful initiative. And then finally, I also want to make you aware of a program that Oregon State University has called the Food Heroes Program. And again, you can Google this and register for it. And one of the concepts that they have or they support are World Culture Wednesdays, thinking about the foods that are consumed by a variety of different um, cultures and how might you expose yourself to some of those um, recipes, meals, ingredients that are being used and actively try and uh, in incorporate these types of foods into your diet. Their website is full of recipes. They are easy, they are quick, 
they are kid tested, um, and it's, it's an exciting and engaging um, website to, to explore, especially if you're interested in um, expanding your cultural relevance. And next, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit now, we've talked about food patterns. Um, now what I'd like to focus a little bit more on are the different components of nutrients within these dietary patterns, the benefits and possibly disadvantages to some of those components, and how you can make some healthier choices individually for individuals that you might be working with, clients, friends, family, and how you might use this information to, to start making some um, decisions. In particular, I'll talk a little bit about protein. I'll talk about carbohydrates, different types, simple carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, fiber, fats, which is the focus of uh, this uh, symposium today, poly and monounsaturated fatty acids, saturated fatty acids, and trans fats. Also, I want to just provide a, a real shout out to fluid and water consumption. And I also want to um, point out some uh, cautionary issues with respect to alcohol consumption. So when we think about protein, and we think about protein in the American diet, most Americans consume significantly more protein than what they actually need. Is it a problem? For healthy individuals, it's probably not a problem. Can it be beneficial? Under some circumstances, it can be. Protein can be very satiating. Um, but do we need all of that protein? Probably not. And so we'll talk a little bit now about how do you figure out how much protein you need. And you can all be sitting here thinking about it on a personal basis of how much protein do I need and how much protein do I consume on a regular basis. So the general recommendations for adults, it's pretty easy for adults. There's a standard recommendation for healthy adults who are not elite athletes. General recommendation is about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, or if we convert that into pounds, about 0.4 grams of protein per pound of body weight. For healthy weight individuals, knowing, um, knowing that can help you figure out how much protein you need. So if you think of somebody that weighs about 140 pounds, and you multiply that by 0.36 grams of protein per pound, that means that somebody needs about 51 grams of protein a day. Traditional recommendations for, for women in that weight range, similar for men, but probably a little bit higher based on what their weight might be. So I've listed a few different food products here and the amount of protein. So as I thought of what I had for breakfast this morning, which was yogurt here, um, some fruit on top of that yogurt, and a little bit of the granola or the nuts that was, that, that was available, I probably consumed with the amount of yogurt that I consumed and the, the nuts in that granola, close to 25 grams of protein. That's half of my protein need for the day. Uh, and it's unintentional, right? It's, I didn't consume a large amount but it was something that was providing enough protein, a protein-dense source of food that was meeting half of my requirements, and it wasn't even noon, and I didn't have any meat. So it's easy to incorporate protein into our diets from a variety of sources, and it's important to recognize that we probably don't need 70 to 100 to 120 grams of protein on a daily basis, but that's what a lot of people are consuming. Downsides of too much protein? And, you know, Dr. Bagby could go into to this conversation for people that have renal disease or if they're, if they're approaching that type of uh, uh, situation in their lives, high-protein diets can be something that stresses the kidney. So it's really important to think about these things and think about what do we actually need and what are we consuming. Um, if you think about uh, animal-based protein, and you think about the amount of chicken that is typically served in a restaurant or that you might prepare for yourself. You go out and you buy skinless chicken breasts and assume that everybody at the table is gonna eat maybe half of that chicken breast. You're probably talking about a three to four ounce portion of chicken right there, about the size of the palm of your hand, maybe more. And that's providing you with about 28 grams of protein, single serving. 
So we have a lot of protein in our food sources in the United States. It's really important for us to recognize that and to think about how can we um, modify our diets if we need to, to think about other sources of foods and the qualities that they have. Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are a great field. As Dr. Bagby said earlier, you know, we had this, this historical process in food marketing and changes in food availability, recognizing at one point that a high fat diet or a high saturated fat diet might not be the healthiest diet. The shift in food manufacturing and marketing to go to low fat foods, but higher carbohydrate, but not necessarily high quality carbohydrate based foods. Now a lot of issues um, and conversation taking place about simple carbohydrates and, and reducing the sources of simple carbohydrates in our diet um, to really focusing on whole grains, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables as the sources of the carbohydrates that we consume. Um, and then fiber. Fiber is a component of plant-based foods. You do not get fiber from from animal products, right? There is no fiber in meat products or dairy products, um, and it is something that is inherent and naturally found in fruits and vegetables. And it's important that we consume fruits and vegetables that don't take out the fiber component. So eating apples with its skin on it, eating potatoes and eating the skin of the potato, eating whole grain products that haven't been refined to remove the high fiber con content of that. Thinking about the sources of grains that you have, the breads that you consume. One of my personal rules, and I, I, I'm gonna share my food rules with you at the end, but one of my personal rules is that when I bre buy bread for myself and my family, that that bread has to have at least three grams of fiber per slice. And there are bread products out there now where you can get five to six grams of fiber per slice of bread. But if you don't know to look, you might not pay attention because traditional white breads have less than a gram of fiber per slice. Um, whole, you might see whole wheat breads, but not whole grain breads that would still have less than a gram of fiber per slice. So again, intentionally making those food decisions to enhance the quality of the food that you're consuming, not just providing calories, not just providing carbohydrate, but really thinking about why am I buying this product and how can I make decisions that give me the biggest bang for my buck? And one of the things that I use just as a, as a quick and easy way is looking at the, the fiber content of slices of bread. Um, it's important to know, again, you can see here, vegetables have about four to five grams of, of uh, fiber per cup, whether it's raw or whether it's been cooked. Um, legumes, beans, red beans, dark red kidney beans are some of the highest fiber containing um, legumes, seven to eight uh, grams of fiber per half a cup, so it doesn't take much. Soluble fiber, you may have heard of soluble and insoluble fiber, two different types two different functions. Insoluble fiber is that fiber that really creates bulk. It creates bulk in the food that is going through your intestinal tract, that's entering your colon, that absorbs water, that helps keep stools a, a normal, healthy consistency. Soluble fiber is the type of fiber that is associated with reducing blood glucose concentrations, reducing cholesterol concentrations. So there are different types of fiber. Soluble fiber is uh, relatively high in oats, certain grains, beans, fruits. So they're present in, in all of these different um, food components, but they're different food components that you can select for those different properties, and they're important. The goal in general for fiber consumption is between about 25 to 30 grams a day. Um, so think about how do you reach that. Most people consume less than 15 grams of fiber per day. Fiber content of most traditional American diets is relatively low at this point in the United States. So it really is something that we need to promote. Individually, among our families, with people that we work with, clients that we might be working with, um, and the communities that we're serving. Okay. 
fats. Again, fats, when we think about fats, we think about them in three different components. Saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, and monounsaturated fat. There's a fourth term, trans fats, that we've heard a lot about over the past probably 10 years. And, and trans fats I'm going to touch on as well. Saturated fats, the way you identify saturated fats is that they're solid at room temperature. So if you look at this cut of meat, you can see this fat content here, which is a saturated fat. It's room temperature, it's solid. The skin underneath, chicken, um, chicken skin, saturated fat, solid at room temperature. Certain types of oils, all oils have different profiles of saturated, mono, and polyunsaturated fats. Some have more than others. Tropical oils, palm oil, coconut oil, if you look at them at room temperature, they're, they're solid. They have relatively high amounts of saturated fat as, uh, as part of their fat profile. That's why they're solid at room temperature. Saturated fats are straight chain fats. They can compact really closely together. They form this immaculate, um, dense fatty acid profile, and it allows them to become solid. And that's a characteristic of saturated fats. So a goal is to reduce saturated fat intake um, across the board for almost everybody. Because saturated fat, high saturated fat um, intake is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease um, and other types of um, chronic conditions. So if you think about fats in general, they're really energy dense. Nine grams of nine calories per gram of fat. For a typical adult, we aren't as dependent upon a high fat diet as infants are. When you think about breast milk, breast milk is about 50% fat. Babies need an energy dense source of nutrition um, so that they can consume the number of calories and the nutrients that they need in a relatively small volume. So breast milk inherently is about 50% fat. Recommendations that we have for people in terms of a fat intake for children and adults is closer to 28, 30, 35% fat. So we aren't as dependent upon that really dense energy source um, as adults. Margarines, margarines and butters um, are about 80% fat. Oils, 100% fat. Slight difference in the number of calories, 100 calories per tablespoon for butter and margarine, about 120 calories per tablespoon for oils. Um, but it's important to think about, again, how much saturated fat are in those um, components. And you see here, again, um, coconut oil having about 12 grams of saturated fat per tablespoon. 92% of the fat in coconut oil is saturated fat. Um, general recommendations, um, again, for saturated fat, that it's less than 10% of your total calories. Um, if somebody were consuming 2,000 calories a day, that'd be less than 20 grams of um, saturated fat. So if you think here, if you cook with a coconut oil or if you include it in recipes, um, a tablespoon of um, uh, coconut oil is half of what that recommendation would be. The American Heart Association has an even more um, strict or conservative recommendation, 5 to 6% of your total caloric intake coming from saturated fat. So how do you do that? How do you reduce saturated fat? Well, you can choose lean meats um, and poultry products. You can, you can choose to purchase and consume lower fat or non-fat dairy products. Um, you can make a transition from saturated fats to other types of oils in your cooking, um, oils that don't have as much saturated fat in them. So vegetable oils over solid, um, solid fats, but not focusing on tropical oils if you're really um, trying to reduce your saturated fat intake. And then when we think about unsaturated fats, there are two types. Polyunsaturated, meaning that they have multiple bends in that structure. They have multiple double bonds or monounsaturated. They have one double bond and one bend in their structure. 
as illustrated in these um, cartoons down here. This represents a monounsaturated fat, which is the type of fatty acid that's predominant in olive oils. Um, and it has one double bond and it has one major kink in it. Those kinks are what, keeping, are what keep the fatty acids from forming really dense um, units, dense nutrient dense and, and calorie dense units. And it keeps it um, liquid at room temperature. And this other cartoon is really focusing on the structure of a polyunsaturated fat. There are multiple bends in that um, fatty acid, make it, making it even more bulky and less susceptible to that um, very uh, crystalline uh, packaging. So when we think about monounsaturated fats, and you probably heard people say, you need to eat more uh, monounsaturated fats. What are the sources of, of good monounsaturated fats? Olive oil? canola oil. So if you, if you cook with different oils, um, olive oil has a very distinct flavor. And so you may use that for certain types of products, um, salad dressings, um, or other uh, types of flavoring that you might uh, intentionally want. Canola oil is a great source of monounsaturated fats, and it doesn't have that really distinct flavor or smell. Um, Peanut oil, safflower oil are also oils that are relatively high in monounsaturated fats. For polyunsaturated fats, we typically think of, co of corn oil, um, soybean oil, flaxseed oil is also um, high in polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are the types of oils that are associated with fatty fishes like salmon and trout and herring and sardines. Um, these fishes all have a good source of polyunsaturated fats, and that is the source of omega-3 fatty acids that we're also um, hearing a lot about and being encouraged to consume more of. Um, omega-3 fatty acids for a variety of purposes, anti-inflammatory effects, for eye health, um, and so these are our potential sources of those polyunsaturated fats, which include omega-3 fatty acids. As I mentioned before, oils are 100% fat. It's different from butter. Butter has protein in it, has some water in it, but oils are 100% fat. So it's important to recognize that. And they provide about 120 calories per tablespoon. Okay. So when you think about how do you modify your diet to reduce um, total fat and saturated fat intake and trans fat? Um, it's important to really look at food labels. Trans fats are those fats that occur from two different sources. One is that they're naturally produced. We all synthesize some trans fat metabolically. It occurs naturally. Animals also have that same enzymatic capacity to create some trans fatty acids. So if you eat animal products and you eat animal products that have fat in it, you are probably consuming some trans fats as a result of that. Not a lot, but some. The real source of trans fatty acids is when you take vegetable oil that has all those kinks in them and you take those kinks out and you hydrogenate those double bonds so they become saturated. That's what partially hydrogenated means. It means breaking down those double bonds and straightening out those molecules so that they become solid at room temperature. That's what shortening is. You know, when you think about making a pie crust traditionally and you're making a pie crust and you use shortening, it's a, it's a hydrogenated vegetable oil that you're working with. It's saturated, it's solid at room temperature, and it's got saturated fats in it, okay? So trans fats occur naturally, but they also have been, they've just infused our diet because we use shortenings and trans fats to create baked goods and other products because it gives it the right feel um, when, and the quality. Um, but what you need to do is pay attention and read food labels and see if it's, it has any trans fats in it. And if it does, recognize that that's something, something that you want to steer clear of, if you can. Um, food labels that say that it contains trans fats, 
if it contains trans fats, the lowest amount that has to be recorded on a food label is 0.5 grams of trans fat. So something that doesn't have at least 0.5 grams of trans fat is going to come across on a food label as having zero trans fats. Might be a little bit in there. But that's really the kind of tipping point for labeling of trans fats on a food label. Um, so using so ways to reduce fats or, or saturated fats, use uh, oils instead of solid fats, select specific types of, of meat and dairy products um, if you consume those products. If you do purchase uh, meat products that do have visible fat, take that off before food preparation. If you leave it in, it's going to absorb into the tissue of the meat, and you will have a higher fat content of that meat. But what does fat do? What does fat do? in the foods that we eat. One, it, it gives it flavor, but it also, it, it tenderizes that meat. That's why certain types of beef that have a higher marbled fat content are so tender when they're prepared. It's because of that fat content. If you buy a low fat type of meat that doesn't have that marbling, you have to prepare it in a different way because the texture is different, right? Round steak is very different than a, than, you know, a filet. It's because of that fat content. So you'll have a little bit of a difference, but it's important if you are interested in reducing fat to remove as much um, of that extractable fat as you can. The way you choose to cook foods, um, baking, broiling, grilling, um, steaming, um, is a lower fat means of, of preparing foods than something that might be deep fat fried or that might be browned in um, butter or oil. So just think about the options that you have for um, modifying the way that you might prepare foods. You can lower the fat content or the fat that you use in preparing baked goods by creating some food substitutions. Um, you can replace half of the fat in a traditional baked good recipe with mashed or strained fruit. So applesauces, bananas, baby foods. Some people will specifically purchase baby foods as a means of, of reducing the fat content of um, a baked product that they might be making. Selecting dairy products that are non-fat or low fat. Replacing eggs, um, whole eggs, with egg whites or egg replacers is a way to um, make a difference. Now fluid intake. You've probably all heard that you need to consume at least eight, gram, or eight glasses, eight to nine glasses of fluid a day. Where does that come from? Um, and do we really need that much fluid? That's one of my personal goals. I am not a drink. I do not drink a lot of fluid. And I need to push myself to drink fluid. Um, and I always challenge, why in the world do we need to drink nine, eight to nine glasses of water a day? Um, as I see and <laughs> lifting her glass um, to remember to do that. So where does that come from? Well, when we think about fluid intake, it includes not only fluid that is a liquid fluid, but it also includes the fluid that's in foods. And in most cases, um, beverages provide about 80% of that total fluid intake, and the foods that we consume, about 20% of that fluid intake. It's important to drink, when you think about fluids, to, to drink as much water as you can, and to drink water throughout the day. Don't wait till you're thirsty, because if you're thirsty, you're already at a point of being underhydrated. Um, and it's also important to, to treat beverages that have calories in the same way that recommendations are made um, for consuming alcohol. I thought this is a really interesting recommendation. Treat juices, sodas, anything that has a caloric content in the way that you might think about modifying or reducing um, total alcohol consumption. And you'll see that on the next slide. Consume in moderation. Easier uh, for adults than for children, um, but something to keep, to keep in mind and think about. So how do you calculate how, many, how much fluid you should consume um, on a regular basis? Well, again, if you think about how much you weigh, and within a relatively um, healthy weight um, range, you can take your weight in pounds, divide that by two, and come up with a general recommendation for the amount of fluid you should be consuming on a regular basis. So if you take somebody that weighs about 140 pounds, 
Divide that by two, you get about 70 ounces of total fluid per day. 70 ounces divided by eight ounces per cup, right, um, tells me that somebody who weighs about 140 pounds should be consuming almost nine glasses, eight ounce glasses of water a day. If you multiply that by that 0.8 value, that's about seven, fluid, seven cups of fluid for that person that weighs about 140 pounds. So it's one way to come up with an individualized estimate of how much fluid you should be com consuming on a regular basis, or how much fluid children or adolescents um, should be consuming. People that are in industries where they're st working strenuously, where they're sweating a lot, um, definitely need to have additional replacement fluids. But this is a good kind of rule of thumb for um, people that are trying to figure out uh, where do they fall within the, that recommendation. Okay, alcohol. Also a big component um, of our food scene, especially in Portland, and we have f incredible wineries here. We have new and upcoming distilleries um, that are cropping up um, throughout Portland and, and the Pacific Northwest. We have wonderful microbrews. Um, it really is a part of our culture here in, in Portland, or it can be. So what are the recommendations for alcohol consumption? Um, it really is that if you do consume alcohol, it's important to do so in moderation. And then how do you define moderation? For women, moderation is one alcoholic beverage a day at most. Usually five, and, and people will say five times a week. So moderate, that's the definition of moderation. For men, it's up to two alcoholic beverages per day, five times a week, okay? So if you think about um, alcohol consumption and you think about consuming a six pack of beer, right here are some of the, um, you know, just general caloric contents of various products. Consumption of a six pack of beer, uh, 12 ounce beers, provides an extra 900 calories per day. So one story that I have to tell is I do do a lot of research with weight loss, weight regulation, and recruiting people into clinical trials where we're looking at different diets and you know, what is the impact of these diets on weight and keeping weight off. And we always uh, screen people out for these trials. And one of our screening questions is, if we're going to be putting somebody on a controlled feeding study, we can't provide alcohol, right? We can't provide alcohol. Um, and we have to screen people out based on their ability to stop drinking alcohol during these times. And I'm always amazed when I'm talking with potential subjects in these studies to find out that they're interested in a weight loss study and they get to the point about telling me a little bit more about their alcohol consumption and they're drinking five to six drinks a night right? Five to six drinks a night. That's 500 calories, five to 600 calories a day. If they were to join my feeding study and they had to stop drinking alcohol, they'd be losing a pound a week just by reducing their alcohol consumption. So people often think about the foods that they consume, but we often forget about the beverages and the caloric content of those beverages, whether it's um, energy performance drinks, or fruit drinks, or alcohol. We just need to be aware of it. Um, and so this is something that I think is, is just really important because it seems to be one of those hidden foods. People don't think about the number of calories that they might be consuming on a regular basis. And then lastly, just to reinforce that we don't know if any alcohol during pregnancy is safe. The recommendation is that women who are pregnant or women who are considering becoming pregnant need to stop drinking alcohol because we do not know what level is safe. And the only way we can be safe is to encourage people not to consume um, alcoholic beverages. Okay, healthy weight prescriptions. How do you get there? So 60, um, about 65% of US adults are overweight or obese defined by body mass index. Body mass index above 25 to 30 is considered overweight. 30 and above is obese with different classifications. So that's really where that 65% comes from. 
by definition based on body mass index, which is an index of how much somebody weighs to how tall they are. Um, and then um, another, I think, important thing to think about is in the US, adults tend to gain unintentionally one to two pounds a weight, uh, one, one to two pounds a year. Just happens leads to 20 to 40 pound weight gain of unintentional weight over a 20 year period of time. And I think it's also important to recognize that most people don't have a hard time losing weight, right? We, in general, can encourage people, help people, and people can be very successful at losing weight for a short period of time. What's tough is keeping that weight off. It's a long-term goal and it's really hard. And the diets that are appropriate for trying to lose weight versus to keep weight off and the lifestyle can be two different things. So when I think about weight management and I think about fat and preventing obesity or addressing obesity, I think about my first goal for working with somebody is to help them keep from continuing to gain weight. That unintentional weight that they don't even realize is happening until they look back and say, wow, when I was in high school, I weighed 130 pounds, and now I weigh 170. What happened, or how did that happen? Um, I work with them on, on considering weight loss plans. It's a temporary process. It's going to require some type of food modification, food restriction, no matter what you do. And we'll talk a little bit about what that actually means. It might include increasing activity, but we know for somebody to lose weight, they have to modify their diet. They have to lower their caloric intake in some way. It's nice if they also increase their activity, but weight loss requires modifying diet. Keeping weight off, modify diet, also requires that you increase your activity. Okay, so two different types of, of patterns. So some of the strategies for working with people when I'm talking about um, weight modification is really knowing and acknowledging what your weight is, identifying what that healthy weight is for that individual, and it might be the weight that they're at. It's, it's, there's a lot that goes into coming up with that um, decision. Setting realistic weight maintenance and weight loss goals, knowing what the barriers are that somebody has and then coming up with some really strategic solutions to, to circumvent those barriers. Um, celebrating successes, and that success might be, I didn't gain any weight over this past month, and that is a great achievement. Um, and then also agreeing to be in it for the long haul. When you modify your diet for weight loss, it's something that is a life practice. Right? It is usually not something that is done for a short period of time and then um, going back to those uh, more traditional lifestyles. So what does it take? I mentioned food restriction. Food restriction can include all different types. Almost every type of weight loss diet re requires some type of food restriction. It might be that you're going to restrict processed foods. Healthier diet, whole grains, whole fruits and vegetables, but you're eliminating processed foods. So there is some type of restriction there. Low carbohydrate ketogenic diets. Eat as much as you want, just don't eat carbohydrates. You're taking carbohydrates out of that diet. You're also taking a lot of incredible vitamins and minerals, but you know that is what that diet is based on. A low fat diet. Some diets are as low as 10% fat. You are eliminating huge uh, types of foods from that type of diet. Plant-based vegetarian vegan diets, no animal products. Um, the DASH Mediterranean, no processed foods, lower saturated fats. You're making significant dietary uh, restrictions in those diets. And then physical activity is definitely the key um, to keeping weight off. I will leave you with this. Um, I don't know if you have access to the slides. I love the Kaiser Permanente Thrive um, campaign. This is one of their uh, recommend, you know, this is one of their ads that they have. You know, begin with an early rise. Mix in a little uh, quick two mile walk. Add a healthy breakfast. Sprinkle in laughter. Reduce stress. Get, get your community together to support you. Continue that type of practice. Add some hard work, some accomplishments. Um, celebrate those accomplishments. Cool down frequently. Take those timeouts. And then flatten and let rest for eight hours, the importance of sleep.
right? Isn't that great? Um, I just, I, I always find those um, so motivational. Another area that I find to be really important um, for thinking about what works for people is referring to the National Weight Control Re Registry. This is a registry that's been around for probably 20 years. It's based out of the University of Colorado. And they have characterized practices that have worked for people who have lost weight and kept that weight off for long periods of time. There's, there are more than 10,000 people in this registry, and these individuals have lost significant weight and kept it off for um, a long period of time. And some of their key points are they ate breakfast. They didn't say what they ate, but they ate breakfast every day. They paid attention to their weight. They, they monitored their weight. They, they were not necessarily focused on it, but they didn't let that creep come back into their lives. They modified their food intake in some way. They addressed portion control. They became active. So to keep weight off, they were intentionally um, participating in moderate to vigorous activity an hour a day, most of them by walking. So it doesn't have to be something that you do that you can't just incorporate into your lives um, without having to join a gym. Um, and they reduce their sedentary time. This slide tells you a little bit about what moderate to severe activity is. At least 30 minutes a day is the general recommendation. 60, 60 minutes a day if you want to maintain your weight or start to lose weight. 60 to 90 minutes a day if you're actually trying to maintain the weight that you have lost and keep it off. Moderate activity, somewhat hard. Your breathing quickens, but you're not out of breath. Light sweat, maybe after 10 minutes, you can carry on a conversation if you're doing it with a friend. Vigorous activity, more challenging. You know, deep breaths, um, more rapid. You're sweating after a few minutes, and it's hard to carry on that conversation. Carrying on a conversation is a great way to stay engaged in the activities that you have, to set realistic goals. SMART goals, you may have heard of them. They're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, relevant, and they're timely. I am going to do one thing this week, and I'm going to do it every day, and I'm going to make that a part of my lifestyle. I'm going to take the stairs. If, it's not more, if, if I need to go up less than three flights of stairs, that's my goal. Um, I'll congratulate myself every week. I'll look back and reflect. I'll say, you know what? Every time I had to walk in the School of Nursing at OHSU, I walked up those three flights of stairs. That's my personal goal. I didn't take the elevator, even though it's right there. I went up those stairs, even if somebody that I was walking with wanted to take the elevator. I say, it's my New Year's resolution. And you know what? They usually join me and walk up the stairs. Um, but I, I am accountable to that. Um, it's relevant. I'm doing this so that I don't gain weight or that I lose weight. I want to feel better. I want to be able to breathe better. Um, and I'm going to do it for at least two weeks, and I'll reevaluate. So setting up those SMART goals. There's an example of a 50-year-old woman. She weighs 170 pounds. She's 5'5", typical gradual weight gain um, over the past 20 years. She's dieted. She's lost weight. She's gained it. She's married, three adult children, not living at home. She works. She works at a desk. She's at the computer all the time. She's got a significant commute. She doesn't have a lot of time. Um, but she's noticed that she's out of breath. So it might not be that she wants to lose weight, but maybe she doesn't want to feel out of breath. So we don't always have to focus on weight. We can focus on health. And that wanting to feel like you can walk up a flight of stairs is an important thing to recognize and an important thing to achieve um, and celebrate. When I work with people to set realistic weight goals, I am not looking at the the, the end goal. I'm looking at what can we do in the next few weeks. And it's not losing the 30 pounds of weight that she might want to lose. It might be, can we get 5%, 10% off? That is the amount that is associated with significant improvement in metabolic markers, health markers. If you can lose 5% of your weight, if you're overweight, that's what it takes to start to see those improvements. And that's, that's where I might start. 
And then thinking about what are those goals going to look like um, for her. Addressing dietary modification. How can we get her walking? What are those barriers to walking? She might not have the time. Time deserts. You know, we talk about food deserts. Time deserts is the other new term that we don't have enough time to do everything that we want to do. Um, what are the solutions? And then how can we support each other? Some food rules for healthy eating. I think it's really important that people do create rules for themselves, um, that they think about those, that they can, they can hold on to them, and they can share those rules with other people. Um, for me, focusing on whole foods, unprocessed foods, as much as possible, knowing that some part of your diet is going to include some, unproce some processed foods. Um, considering vegetables, really focusing on that one component of enhancing diet. Drinking water and drinking it throughout the day. Cutting back or potentially eliminating alcohol for some, um, for some individuals. And identifying an accountability buddy. If you know that you can say this to somebody and that you can be accountable to that person, you're more likely to um, maintain these um, healthy practices. So last slide, for me, some of my personal goals. I've got two dogs. They get me out of bed every single morning at 6 o'clock, if not earlier, to go on a walk. We walk for 30 minutes. Um, I eat breakfast every day. It might be that I'm eating breakfast in the car going to work but I'm eating something before I get there. And it might be a banana. Um, I take my lunch to work. I don't go out to eat, despite the fact that we have some incredible restaurants at OHSU, right? But I know that if I want to maintain a, and know what I'm eating and know that it's relatively healthy, I take my lunch to work. I call my sandwich, my sandwich, sandwich, my salad in a sandwich. I take two high fiber slices of bread and fill it with all kinds of vegetables. And, the, and I eat it right out of a baggie because it's messy, right? But that's, that's how I get in um, more vegetables and higher fiber. Um, I don't buy things that I know are my pressure points, you know, ice cream, um, peanut butter. Those are things that macaroni and cheese. Uh, those are things that I just, I don't get it. I don't keep them in the house. One of the things that we know that is if an adult changes their dietary pattern, it trickles down to their kids in positive ways, but also in negative ways. So all of these things are, are appropriate recommendations for a household. Um, four to five pieces of fruit. When I go out to dinner, I always order fish, whether I want to or not, because I know that it's good for me. Um, and I request a take-home box. I split it in half and take, take half of it home. Um, if I eat cereal, I eat it for dessert. That's a big change for me. My family loves cereal, right? Um, but that I, I, I consider it a dessert at this point. Drinking more water, walking the dogs a second time, I've got 60 minutes of intentional activity. Um, and then I take the stairs. So I hope these can be helpful and uh, that they can add to your repertoire of of uh, strategies for enhancing uh, your own diet, your family's diet, and the, um, the food environment of those that are around you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? I, I, I'm going to give, I wanted to, I, I've got, anyway, yeah, I don't need to explain it. There you go. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Yes, okay. Um, one of the <clears throat> key, um, one of the pieces that I struggle with as a dietitian, as a nutrition instructor with these recommendations is our focus on recommending low fat and fat-free dairy products and um, half egg products, as I call them, so the yolk removed. Um, when we think about our recommendation for whole grains, we actually, steer away from that when we were talking about dairy and full fat. And I recognize that we are a dairy heavy culture. Um, I'm curious in, in my teaching, um, I've been teaching for the past seven years, what I try to focus on is treating dairy like you would treat alcohol or a treat, right? And so perhaps just a few ounces a day of a whole food because it just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to think we're recommending a, a drink that when you remove the fat has three teaspoons of sugar in it without that package of fat to help your body metabolize it, digest it, et cetera. 
And then when we take away the yolk from an egg, we take away a lot of the nutrients. And again, most eggs that are produced in this country are very low nutrient quality. Um, but I'm curious, can we shift the conversation from low fat and non-fat dairy products to whole milk from pastured cows? And I know there's an access issue. There's not a lot of cows that are pastured in the United States. And can we shift the conversation from half eggs to eggs from pastured chickens that are eating their typical diet? And so that's just a question I ask. It's what I have felt most comfortable teaching rather than telling people to drink oodles and oodles of low fat dairy products or eat them. Um, and I'm just curious what you, Dr. Tadler, think about that and just as kind of a, a posing a question to the general public about can we, can we shift, I, I would like to pose, propose that as a, as a profession, as a medical and nutrition profession, that we shift that conversation. Yeah, I, you know, I think the way I would respond to that was, um, I think there are a variety of ways of, for people to put together, and, and you'll know this, a variety of ways for people to put together the different types of foods that they're going to be consuming. Um, and I think that full-fat dairy products, you know, low-fat, non-fat dairy products can be an incredibly nutrient-rich component of a diet. Um, and I would always work with somebody to look at their overall diet profile and patterning to make sure that no matter what they're doing, that their diet profile is providing them with adequate amounts of calcium. Or And, and calcium might be the one thing that I'd really focus on as um, a nutrient that we get from dairy products that, is, that can be really challenging to get from other foods because the way we eat right now, the, the foods that most people consume are not high calcium containing foods. So I, I try to just, uh, when I'm working with somebody that's trying to lose weight, to look at their whole dietary profile and think of ways that we can make some modifications that they, that they might identify as being successful. And one of those successful things might be, change, maybe they're not going to change the type of dairy product they're consuming, but the volume. And just as you were saying, maybe they're going to stay. And you know, with just a, 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 a nutrient-rich whole milk type of product, but consume less of it. That's great. Um, but I really think we need to think about the person and the individual and identify things that are gonna work for them and um, start with where they are and then make those modifications based on where we might encourage them to be as successful as possible. But I agree, I'm not trying to say that the only types of dairy products that we consume should be non-fat or low-fat. I think it really needs to be individualized. And I think they can be a healthy food source and food choice. Um, and uh, also, like you said, I think beverages that we consume, we often consume beverages and uh, that we need to think of calorie-containing beverages similar to alcohol and uh, that they need to be consumed in moderation. Some, you know, potentially not consumed at all. Um, but n recognizing the amounts that we consume and then modifying them appropriately. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah.